so for this lecture, we're going to touch on uh, a sort of unusual topic that is pretty un pretty important uh, for solid state physics, uh, which is this concept of effective mass. Um, so we're going to be using this uh, quantity in a bunch of different calculations, and there's also the, um, some weirdness in it when we get to 3D. Um, so it's just really important that we understand what effective mass is, uh, especially for um, things like holes. So for example, uh, you can probably guess that electrons have some uh, amount of mass because we know that electrons have mass. Um, but what about holes? Because holes are the absence of an electron. So they're not actually, they're like, they're nothing. They're made up of nothing. Um, so they shouldn't have any mass and yet they do have an effective mass. Uh, and so we can use that quantity to do certain calculations. Um, so we're gonna understand sort of what an effective mass is um, so that we can more, um, more efficiently understand what's going on here. Um, so we're going to start with the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Um, so you should be familiar with uh, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Um, it's a it's property of wave mechanics, which restricts the precision which with, with which we can simultaneously have information on a particle's position and momentum, um, or energy and uh, what time, or, and its uh, position in time. Um, what it really is, is... Um, any conjugate pair operators, um, you can't have simultaneous information on them um, greater or, or less than uh, h bar, which remember is Planck's constant divided by two pi. Um, so what this does is it just tells us that um, we can't know both the position and the momentum at the same time with um, arbitrary precision. There's a certain limit. Um, so if we want to understand um, some of these fixed energy wave, uh, some of these wave functions and how particles move uh, through systems, uh, we need to use a superposition of, and of wave functions uh, that are confined to some segment of a crystal. Um, so it, in order to address particle motion in crystals, we make those superpositions of wave functions uh, to make wave packets. Um, so this is sort of like what a wave packet might look like. Um, and you can imagine, here, I'll uh, switch colors here. So you can imagine that if you were to like Fourier transform this, um, so this is gonna be like frequency and then some arbitrary something. This might be made up of a frequency here and like a frequency here and a frequency here. So there's a bunch of fixed energy wave functions of given frequencies, right? that are super, uh, super imposed on each other, which results in, uh, in this guy here, which results in that wave packet. Oops. And... Great, okay. So the wave packet is a linear combination of wave functions um, such that the probability of finding the particle in a given region of space is unity at some time. Um, so that's what the wave packet tells us, is that there's a whole bunch of wave functions that we added together such that we know that if we look in this region at some point in time, we are going to find the particle in there somewhere, right? And then maybe at a different point in time, maybe this has moved, right? Maybe uh, now it's over here that we can find the particle. But at a given point in time, there is a certain space which we are going to find the particle. Um, that's what the wave packet is for. You can think of it like a photon. Um, so let's consider how this wave packet moves. Because remember I said like maybe at a different time, we'll find it in a different point in space. Um, so we're going to approximate the motion of the wave packet by considering the center of the packet. Uh, we're gonna sort of simplify it. Think of it like, you know, spherical cows in a vacuum. Um, we're gonna approximate this wave packet as like a point um, that is moving with some velocity. We're gonna call it uh, V sub G, uh, which is, has a velocity dx dt, just regular old velocity in one dimension. So uh, classical wave theory yields uh, that we have our wave packet, which is here, and we're just gonna approximate it with that center point. We have our velocity dx dt. So this, we're gonna, go from looking at the full thing here 
to just approximating this. Uh, and that uh, we can combine with the frequency and the wave number, um, which we have encountered before, to get that V sub G is equal to dx dt, which is equal to the change in frequency with respect to wave number, same expression. Okay, then we can replace the frequency, the angular frequency with uh, this quantity here, energy divided by h bar, uh, which you just might know from uh, doing some of the energy calculations um, to get this expression here. So we are going to replace omega with energy over h bar. And now remember, we said that these are fixed energy wave functions. Um, so energy is going to be fixed, and that's a constant too. Um, or excuse me. Um, so we're doing this over a constant. Um, so we have the derivative of energy over h bar. That h bar is a constant. And so we're going to pull it out. Uh, so we have one over h bar times dE over dK. So the change in energy with change in wave number. Okay, so now we have an expression which defines how our particle moves. We have uh, an expression for its velocity, right? That's this over here. The velocity is equal to one over h bar multiplied by the change in energy uh, over change in wave function. Now, what happens if we apply a force, right? So force will uh, cause a change in the velocity. It'll do work on the packet, causing its energy to increase. Um, so we have some force, which is a change in energy with a uh, change in time, uh, right? Because we're gonna do work on our packet. Thus, uh, we can rewrite this, say DE is equal to FDX, uh, and we can rewrite that to say that's equal to the velocity, which remember is dx dt, um, multiplied by the change in time. Okay. So now we have an expression for the force and we have an expression for the velocity. So that allows us to rewrite this again. Um, so we have now the force rewritten in terms of uh, dE dt, here, so we're just using uh, this expression up there, uh, which is equal to uh, this right here. Because uh, remember, we had, we had this dE dt, which we're going to split up into dE dk and dK dt. Right, because this is just saying dK dk, right? We have that expression now. And we have this group velocity relationship, um, which will allow us to rewrite uh, the force as the derivative of h bar k over uh, uh, with respect to time. So we're going to look at the change in k, change in wave number with respect to time is going to be equivalent to the force. Now uh, we're going to differentiate vg or uh, v sub g. Uh, which recall is uh, the same as doing the force, right? We're going to cause a change in the velocity, which is an acceleration, which is a force. Um, we do that respect, with respect to time. So we have uh, this equation, which we had from before. We're going to uh, differentiate it and get one over h bar squared, right? Because remember, um, remember, we get from, I think, the dE. We're going to want one over h bar squared. We're going to get d squared e over dk squared, right? Because we're doing this d dt. And dhk over dt. So this is going to be our expression for the change in velocity. Uh, now we're going to solve for uh, this expression here, because note it shows up here. And it shows up uh, here. So this is equivalent to the force. So what we're going to do is solve for the force. Um, so we're going to rearrange. We're going to get d, dk 
or dh bar k over dt, which is equivalent to the force, which is going to be equal to h bar squared, the inverse of that expression, uh, second derivative energy with respect to uh, wave number k, uh, and then dvg dt. Okay, now, super, super important that you notice that this is just the expression f equals ma, right? Because remember, a is equal to dv dt, right? Just like how velocity is equal to dx dt, right? Because acceleration is second derivative. So what we have here is an expression f equals ma. So we have a new expression for mass. Uh, so if we divide this up, notice we have f and f, these are the same. Uh, VG, uh, v, uh, dv, dt, and a, which are the same thing. And then we have this thing here, which is the h bar squared, second derivative of e and k. That is equivalent to m. That's mass. Um, so it's kind of a weird expression. Uh, but we're going to denote that as this quantity m star, or the effective mass of our packet. Um, so for some arbitrary wave packet, we can define a mass or an effective mass. So recall, like, so the hole, for example, doesn't actually have mass because it's made of nothing, but it can act as though it has a mass. And that quantity, that mass that it acts like it has is given by this expression here. Um, so one of the things to note is that M's, uh, the effective mass is related to the second derivative of E with respect to K. So where have we seen with, uh, the energy as a function of K? Band diagrams, E versus K diagrams. Um, so you probably remember in one of the previous lectures, uh, we kind of made you know this number here and we had like our bands and this, and on this axis was E, and on this axis was K. So we've what we've done here is figured out a way where we can relate the effective mass of a particle to where it is on an E versus K diagram. Um, so let's look at a hypothetical set of energy bands. Uh, so mathematically, the effective mass is going to be proportional to one over the curvature. Uh, so remember, if we have, let's just say, like some exponential thing here, so we have just like y equals x squared, right? If we take the derivative of that, we get a line, so we get dy dx is equal to 2x. And then we're going to take the derivative again. And that's going to be constant, right? d squared y over dx squared is going to be equal to 2, right? Uh, so what we're measuring here, so this can be a measure of the curvature of the graph. Right, because the more curvy it gets, the more that number changes. So in this example, uh, we've got an E versus K diagram of two hypothetical bands. Uh, so we have A and B. Notice B has a much steeper curve. It has more curvature than A. Uh, so in this example, we have the, the curvature of A is less than that of B. So if we have less curvature, right? If A has less curvature, that would be like one over two versus one over four. So less curvature is a bigger number since we're inversely proportional to it, right? Let's get rid of that. Okay, so in this case, the effective mass of a particle in band A is going to be greater than the effective mass of a particle in band B. So that could be a neat 
little trick and we can see how effective masses can change. Uh, we can also use a different example to come up with like some general ideas about uh, effective mass. So this, this one is like a real mathematical thing. You know, if, if you have different curvatures, you're going to change your effective mass. But then like, like let's look at what a, an average curvature might be, right? Um, so a standard shape and an e versus, uh, e versus k diagram is kind of this little s sort of shape. Um, so let's take the derivative of that. You're going to get this inverse parabola. Uh, and then we'll take the derivative again to get this sort of shape. Note that uh, this is going to be positive and this is going to be negative, right? We're crossing the zero threshold here. Also note, that's approximately constant and that's approximately constant. We'll come back to that. Um, okay, so from these plots, we can deduce that near the bottom of any given band, the effective mass is positive, right? Because we have bottom here, which is going to translate to right there. Right, so it's going to be positive. We can also see that the effective mass is negative near the top of any band. So similarly, we have the top of the band translating to down here. And that's negative effective mass. Uh, so that's kind of weird. Um, and remember, we're not working with real masses here. Um, so what an eff a negative effective mass means is that if you apply a force on it, it's just gonna move, it's gonna accelerate the opposite way that you would expect from classical mechanics. Um, right, so with a normal F equals MA, if we have some particle and we apply a force in this direction, we would expect it to accelerate that way. But if it is if it has a negative effective mass, if we apply a force in this direction, it actually accelerates this way. It's in the opposite direction than we expect. So that's a, a little funky, but something that is completely mathematically valid. Because again, this isn't a real mass, it's fine. Think weird things happen with waves. Uh, also note that near the top and the bottom of the bands is where we find the chemically important electrons, right? So we have electrons all through here but the ones that we're actually moving around are typically the ones like maybe up here, um, or maybe we're moving electrons up from another band and putting them down here. So what we get from that is that the chemically important electrons, the ones near the top and bottom of the band, um, have approximately constant curvature. They're about approximately parabolic. Um, which means that if this is a constant, then the effective mass here is constant near the edges of all of our bands. Uh, so we don't have to worry so much because, you know, we, we see that the effective mass is a function um, of where you are in your E versus K diagram. But since we don't actually care so much about an electron that's like here, um, we don't have to worry about the fact that its effective mass changes. We only care about those guys down there and their effective masses are basically constant all the time. So that makes our lives a lot easier. Um, so that's a basic rundown of effective mass. It is a property of wave packets, which we use to understand how electrons and holes move through crystals. Um, and it's just a way to understand how these things are moving, what happens if you apply forces to them. Um, and the important thing to note is that near the tops and bottoms of the bands, which is where you're going to find your chemically important electrons and holes, their effective masses will be constant.